I'm a PhD student. I, stu I study how the open science hardware movement can contribute to democratize science and technology, especially in the global south. And um, I have other hardware projects that if you want to, I can, you can contact me, I can tell you about. So just to start, uh, sorry, one second, there. So science, you know this better than anyone, but uh, also mostly in life science, but science demands tools. You can do anything if you, you can produce data if you have your tools, which are a super wide variety of, of them, right? It's like analog tools, electronic tools, wet tools, as, as um, we are not only talking about um, electronics, which is the first image that appears there when we talk about open hardware. Um, but all the tools we use in the scientific process, in, this, in the research process, we could say 99% today, they are closed. And when we say they're closed, we're talking about that the designs of the tools, the blueprints, the how-to of the tool is not available for anyone but the vendor. So this is like the equivalent of proprietary software, let's say. And this um, brings some problems for researchers and for society in general. So especially for, for researchers, one of the problems is that when you don't have access to the design of or to understand how your tool works, we call that is a black box. Um, it's complicated when you don't fully understand how the process of sample to data is performed. Um, this has some problems not only for the for the research and knowledge production process itself, but also, for example, when this equipment breaks down and you have to um, wait for the supplier to repair it and you have a big delay uh, waiting times for because you are probably not a big force to push for the vendor to come and repair your, your equipment. This is especially more difficult in countries where um, that are um, not far away from the from the factories or from the centers where these tools are produced. Another another um, pain, let's say, is that these tools are very difficult to customize. And usually in science, you want to customize your tools because you, if you are doing cutting edge research, then you know what you need, and it will be. Uh, it, it's the case of many researchers that they want to tweak their tools and it's very difficult for them because first of all, they have to reverse engineering what they already have, which implies open equipment, uh, trying to understand how it works. It's a lot of time that if they had the blueprints, this would be time saved. Another thing is that usually it's really expensive. And again, this is um, feeding the knowledge gap that we have between Global North and Global South countries. There is a lot of science production in Global North countries and there is not so much in Global South countries because it's mainly um, many, many factors, but one big factor is that people don't have access to equipment. Equipment is very expensive. So all these um, pains that are derived from having closed hardware are uh, a reality and is something that people have been addressing for a long time. But the good news, is that people make tools. And in the last 10 years, let's say, there, um, there has been a big wave of um, people all around the world building and building different kinds of artifacts, not only for science, artifacts in general. There are many factors for explaining this. Um, one of the most important factors is the 3D printing revolution, let's say, uh, because most of these artifacts are combinations of 3D printed parts and low cost electronics. So another factor is that electronics nowadays are quite accessible. And another important thing is that the arrival of boards, easy boards like Arduino, allowed um, not only researchers, but people in general, allowed the people to tweak electronics, to play with them, to, um, uh, as Yo was uh, mentioning, do an iterative process over electronics, improving the designs, trying. You don't have to be able to solder uh, in order to try things. So everything is becoming easier and people are just building stuff. So in this slide, you see some of the um, open hardware for science designs that I wanted to showcase. In general, the rule is that if you need it, probably someone has started experimenting with it and there is a design somewhere in the internet that you will be able to find. Um, so I'm showing there the AudioMoth. AudioMoth is um, an open device, open acoustics device that people use it for monitoring um, 
noises in the audible and non-audible spectrum. So it's a uh, the same to biologists working in conservation and ecology in general. Um, the other one is um, a very high-tech device, uh, which is an open AFM, an atomic force microscope. And this is developed by uh, EPFL at Lausanne, researchers working on a laboratory of nano and bio instrumentation. Again, they have been uh, dealing with uh, closed materials all the time and they work on developing instrumentation. So they wanted to, they reverse engineer everything they could and they wanted to document it so people don't, go, don't have to go through that all over again, every time. The third one, um, Open Drop, is a microfluidics platform developed by Gaudi Labs. And um, the interesting um, part about this is that also the um, Open Drop is part of a big set for bio open biology instrumentation developed by Gaudi Labs too. So you can go there to the link and, and check it. Open Flexure is a, is a microscope that is being used right now to detect malaria very easily um, and in a very cheap way um, in Ghana and another, um, I think in Peru, coming soon. OpenQCM is a very precise scale uh, that again is open hardware. And Back Your Brains is a company that makes open hardware uh, neuroscience, neuros uh, sorry, neuroscience experiments um, to teach neuroscience to kids at schools in a cheap and easy way. So all of these equipments, and these are just examples, are um, open science hardware tools that have some advantages over the proprietary ones. In general, and uh, this is um, not, um, oh, sorry, I was seeing the chat. <laughs> we use backyard tools in our brain reach. Oh yeah. Yeah, backyard tools is super, is super popular, it's super nice too. So um, some, some characteristics of open hardware or why are people building stuff? In general, um, open hardware for science is more affordable than proprietary options. So, this doesn't mean that it's low cost because there is a um, big uh, preconception and misconception about open hardware that all open hardware is low cost, do it yourself, and therefore it's associated with less quality. And uh, it's, a, it's a common um, question that I get like from, from researchers saying, can I publish a paper in Nature using open science hardware? Well, yeah, you can. And there are like people are using open science hardware to publish. In, uh, in journals, but no problem at all. Um, this leads me to another important um, fact, and is that if we know how tools work, then we can talk about real reproducibility. So we um, usually try to push open hardware into open science uh, discussions, because for us, it's pretty important that in this whole reproducibility crisis, we talk about tools, right? If we know which are the tools that people are using, then we can absolutely reproduce what they have done in their research. Another important thing, as I was mentioning before, is that this is repairable. So if this is why universities are seeing open hardware with good eyes right now, because if you have a, a fab lab, which is something common at the university, and you have techie people there, and you, your tool is open hardware, then maybe someone there can help you repair it, and you have less delays, and you have less waiting times for you to use the equipment again. And then there is the, the learning and fun. Lots of people develop tools because it's a lot of fun. And also because they can customize and tweak instruments a bit just to experiment with new things without this, this waiting times. Another um, benefit that is usually overlooked a bit uh, when, when we give talks for academics and researchers is that it's not, um, it's a big thing for people in the global south. It's a big thing when you have really small budgets to do your research and suddenly with the same money, instead of having one tool to do your analysis, you have 10. And we're talking of these orders of magnitude in terms of uh, reduction of costs. There, are, uh, there is research on this where people say there is a 90% reduction of cost in, in equipment. So it's not, it's not a small thing. So, um, there are lots of people doing open hardware for science, and I would say most of them now are gathered in a community called Global Open Science Hardware, or GOSH. This is a community which was created, like the first gathering was in 2016, then uh, they had, we had another gathering in Chile in 2017, and China in 2018. There is the manifesto that you can check online, I will give you the links afterwards, but um, the idea of this is that 
there is a roadmap of the community and everything is very horizontal and discussed because it's a very diverse community. The idea is making open science hardware ubiquitous by 2025, which is a super ambitious goal, but we're not that far. So it, it's uh, something to, to take into account and there are lots of resources that you can use within this community. So what can you do if you think that you could benefit from using open science hardware or you want to learn more about it? So you can join the discussion in our forum. It's a very friendly space. Don't be afraid. You don't have to be expert in electronics at all. Most people are not. Most people here learn on the internet with peers. Um, you can document if you have a development um, different platforms. Many people use, of course, uh, GitHub for software, but they also use it for uploading uh, designs of electronics and 3D printed parts. There are specific platforms for this that are now are more than ever. Uh, DocuBricks is one, Kitspace is another. Some people do it in Open Science Framework too. You can follow Open Hardware Leaders, <coughs> sorry, which is our program for supporting people who are um, making Open Science Hardware in science and outside science. And there is also a journal that is managed by the community, the Journal of Open Hardware. And the uh, special thing about it, also be, besides being a community journal, of course, open access, is that we review um, the designs, which is not common, right? So you submit your source files and we take a look at them and we, we make sure that everything you have there is open and available to everyone. So some useful links, I leave them there. You have the links to the slides in the notes. Um, we have a collaborative list of resources for open hardware Feel in GitHub. Feel free please to, to edit and comment. Um, there is a lot coming for uh, open science hardware community in 2020 in terms of residencies and in terms of projects that are um, scaling a bit. And uh, feel free again to go to the GOSH forum and just drop your question or contact me directly. If you don't want to go to the forum, just send me a message on Twitter or send me an email. Totally open to it. <laughs>